Building a strong immune system is as topical as ever, but very few people are thinking about how the mouth is one of the primary immune organs. Today, I'm here with specialist periodontist, Dr. Al Dannenberg, with a very special discussion about the immune system and the mouth and how your gums, bone health all connect together to create a strong immune system. Al has a very special story to share on his own health journey, and I'm really excited to dive into this topic. I think it's something that few people are really kind of discussing in a meaningful way, and I just think, you know, the mouth gives us so many clues as to how to build a strong immune system. And Al, you're the one of the best people to talk about it. It's great to catch up. Thank you. Listen, I love always these fire chats with you. It's just amazing. And what's really amazing is that you are like uh, halfway around the world. And here I am, here you are, and it's like you're sitting in my living room. So it's amazing. It's amazing. I will tell you uh, that it is an interesting introduction, but I am going to be somewhat controversial. So uh, you'll you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Well, look, it's a you know you've walked the walk. You know you've been a um, you know clinical specialist you know for you know your entire career, and but there's some really kind of you know personal um journeys that you've you've been on yourself and we were just talking before we jumped on here i really think that health practitioners that go on a healing journey themselves and understand the the body from their own perspective and then how this melds into how patients can heal themselves i think that's something that is really powerful for you know the medicine model and i'm i'm just really you know excited to hear your personal story and happy to see you so well I am doing well. So would you like to tell me to tell you about my personal story? You want to ask questions or just have me uh, spout out? Yeah, that's um, – look, so for those that aren't familiar, so you had a particular health challenge come up, you know, pop up out of the blue. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a bit over a year and a half ago now, wasn't it? So, yeah, yeah let's, let's, let's go back to the start and just and, – and, you know. Well, here's how, here's how it started. Just um, – April 2018. I'm 71 years old. I believe I am amazingly healthy. I would consider myself the senior poster boy for a primal lifestyle. And I was doing seminars. I was doing consultations. I was seeing active patients. I had been in practice for 44 years, a long time. So I was actually traveling to Austin, Texas from Charleston, South Carolina. And I was going to speak at the Paleo FX meeting, and I was talking about the gut and the oral cavity. You know, that's a subject that I know a little bit about. So I was traveling through Atlanta Airport, big airport. I generally walk from concourse to concourse if I have enough time for my flights. I had a big bag on my shoulder. And as I was walking, I noticed that my right shoulder started to get sore. And that's not really typical. Um, got to Austin, did my seminar, got back to Charleston, and the soreness never went away. I'm thinking I pulled a rotator cuff or, you know, something happened. And I'm a little pig-headed, and I didn't do anything. And the pain goes from my shoulder to my back and then from my back to my sternum area, my chest. And it's getting too uncomfortable. So I contact my physician who I've seen for over 35 years and, and I get to see him in actually September or late August of 2018. And he looks at me and he says, yeah, there's something going on. Yeah, duh. Yeah, there's something going on. So he says, let's do some blood work. He does a basic CBC and blood chemistries. He also adds in a uh, C-reactive protein. And when the results come back, it turns out that everything is normal. And that's interesting. Everything is in normal range except the C-reactive protein, which indicates I have some significant chronic or acute, not knowing which, but systemic inflammation. Now, it doesn't tell you where the inflammation is coming from, so he decides to do an MRI. So he does an MRI, and uh, he calls me and asks if I want to come into the office or we'll discuss it over the phone. I said, how bad is it possibly going to be? Let's talk about it. And he said, and he gets very serious, and he says, 
I think you have either lymphoma, leukemia, or multiple myeloma. Whoa. He says, I have two vertebral compression fractures, several broken ribs, and a hairline fracture in my pelvis. He says, did somebody beat you up? And obviously that's not what happened. And he said, we need to get an oncologist to take a look. Now, here I am, 71, thinking I am the primal poster boy, the, the senior poster boy for a primal lifestyle. How could I be sick? And how could I have cancer? All three of these are cancer. So the oncologist comes in. He does a PET scan and a variety of other tests. There was a soft tissue mass around the side of my spine. We do a biopsy of that, a whole bunch of specific uh, malignancy tests. And my wife and I and my adult children are in the office with my oncologist. And he tells me that I have IgA kappa light chain multiple myeloma, which is incurable bone marrow cancer. And if I don't do anything, I have three to six months to live. Wow. What wow. Like, yeah, what a, what a moment that must have been for you. Yeah, you know, I, you, it was you, like if you ever saw a movie with a uh, tractor trailer T-boning a small car, I was the small car. And it was devastating. My life flashed by me in an instant. But at the same time, I had the wherewithal to ask some questions. And the first question I asked was, so you're telling me it's incurable. And he says, yes, you will die from multiple myeloma. Okay. And then he says, but we need to start chemotherapy tomorrow. Tomorrow. Now you'll go in remission and we'll maybe do other treatment, but we need to do the chemotherapy tomorrow. And I said, well, wait a minute. You're telling me that this is incurable. Why am I doing chemotherapy? And he says, well, we can get you in remission and you'll feel fine until it comes back. And then we'll have to do different chemotherapy because the original would not work anymore. And eventually the chemotherapy will stop working. I'm not a candidate for stem cell therapy. So eventually I will die from the complications of multiple myeloma, but I'll extend my life. And I said, well, wait a minute. Now, if I'm on chemotherapy, isn't that going to decrease the quality of my life? And he said, yes, it will. And we talked about that. And I said, well, I'm not doing chemotherapy because the only thing that is important to me right now for my wife and my children, and they're listening to me talk about this and they're agreeing with me, is my quality of life. I don't care if I'm going to die in three to six months. I want to have the same quality of life that I have right then. And I don't want to be chemically induced to have a De decreasing in my quality of life. So I elected not to do chemotherapy. I did elect to do some radiation treatment on my sternum because the pain was so severe at this point, I couldn't breathe well. So I did that. It didn't cure the disease, but it made the pain go away. So I started to do some research to figure out what unconventional cancer protocols I could put together, integrate, to maybe get my body to heal itself rather than using chemotherapy to destroy my entire immune system. And now we're talking about my immune system. This is the only reason that you and I are alive today. It's either we have a, ro a robust immune system on one end of the pendulum or a totally compromised immune system where if we go outside and we catch a cold, we'll probably die from pneumonia. So I needed to figure out what I could do, and I did, and I went and found several people and did a lot of research on PubMed, and I started doing certain things that actually kept me very, very stable for another year, so I outlived his prognosis, and I'll tell you what happened. Now, before it, we go into yeah. your, um, in, I, I want to dive into your protocol, but I was just thinking that the, the way you tell that story, I, I, I wonder in hindsight, like the markers of systemic inflammation and then the diagnosis of bone loss. Like, do you look back at that and kind of see what was your mind as a periodontist 
you know, thinking like, because, you know, we people see them, these marker points in a much lower, um, you know, severity of, of diagnosis in the mouth. Where do you think, you know, your mind as a specialist periodontist was kind of leading in terms of how, you know, how the body uses inflammation and the, the relationship to bone, you know, because this is something that many people suffer with today. Well, here, here's something interesting because of the chemistries. If you have the disease I have, I should have had a very high calcium serum, which I didn't. It was in normal range. I should have had a very high alkaline phosphatase, talking, showing that there is a lot of bone damage and, and, and breakdown. It was in the normal range. There were no telltale signs or symptoms, well, symptoms in my body, but telltale signs on these, these lab tests which were general lab tests. The sad thing is multiple myeloma is not easily detected until it's late in the game. This is what happened to me. Uh, I was not thinking about periodontal disease, but I was thinking about what's going on. And I will tell you that not only I had this diagnosis um, of multiple myeloma, the radiologist who read the PET scan explain that I had innumerable lytic lesions throughout my skeleton, which mean I, which means that I have a skeleton like a person with severe osteoporosis. And the problem is that my skeleton is extremely fragile and risk and risk prone to pathological fractures. And this is what has happened. That's why I had all these little breaks in my sternum and, and uh, vert vertebral column. So the bone is very compromised. I don't know why. I can tell you, uh, I mean, the cancer is doing this. I know that my jaw is healthy. My mouth is healthy. Never, never have bleeding, never had bleeding. You know, if I had all these terrible things because my immune system was so compromised, I should be a pretty sick guy. And I wasn't because I believe the way I was living a primal lifestyle with a primal diet actually enhanced my immune system beyond a typical multiple myeloma patient. And as I go with my protocols, I am continuing to enhance my immune system way above what theoretically I should be experiencing with malignant plasma cells, which is what m multiple myeloma is. Do you think, um, so when you kind of look back as to the, you know, the root cause you know, because we've we've talked about your pre-story, your kind of whole movement into uh, understanding, you know, food and diet and the, its role in the body. What, does it seem like maybe there were levels that you'd healed, and then there was something in your past that, um, you know, that, that potentially, uh, you know, was was a burden to the immune system or? Um... Absolutely, I think I have the answer. So I'm kind of geeky. So after I got uh, diagnosed, I needed to figure out or try to figure out why the hell do I have this disease when I was eating and living a primal lifestyle six years prior to that. And so a lot of people have said, well, obviously a primal lifestyle isn't very good because you got cancer. Well, come on, guys, give me a break. Just like any chronic disease, it starts decades before it manifests. And here's what I found out. I did some research. I found a paper that was published maybe, I can't remember, 2012, 2014, something like that, where this researcher actually looked at a cohort of dentists, my age group. So it was 65 to 75, male dentists age 65 to 75 compared to the male population of that age group. And it turns out that male dentists in my age group have a significantly higher prevalence of cancer, especially multiple myeloma. That's interesting. Now, the paper did not discuss what caused the multiple myeloma, but it said the prevalence was there. So I kind of racked my brain to figure out what was happening to me that was different than other people or dentists. Turns out it's very interesting. Plasma cells are very susceptible to low-dose ionizing radiation. That's dental x-rays. When I was in dental school, 44 years prior to that, when I was in dental school, 
I had an, a, a, a unique kind of a dental environment where four dental students literally were sur uh, sur surrounded a dental x-ray machine and all the instructors came to us. It was like at, we had a little mini clinic and there were 120 students in my, my school. The x-ray machines go on and off all the time. You know, don't hear them or smell them or feel them. There's a little red dot, you know, light that goes on. But, you know, I'm a dental student. I, I, I'm impervious to anything and everything. And I'm not thinking about that. And we didn't have badges uh, that we needed to wear to, to see if we had radiation exposure. So it is possible that I had four years of dental school, two years of graduate school. So six continuous years. It is possible that I was exposed too much is ionizing radiation and there was one plasma cell in my body that became malignant and stayed malignant it never killed itself off through apoptosis there was no reaction from the immune system to gobble up that one plasma cell and that one plasma cell would continue to reproduce eventually to become millions and millions of plasma cells that are malignant now I believe that was one of the causes. The other cause in dental school, we put in uh, mercury fillings, dental amalgams, and that is made with a uh, free mercury. And I was playing with free mercury in my hands like kids today play with Play-Doh. And it's not, I didn't do it uniquely. Every dental student did it. It was fun to play with. And when we were finished playing with it, we threw it on the floor. And these little beads of silver balls just danced around and all of a sudden disappeared appeared, but they actually vaporized. Who knew that? The dental school, my dental school and every dental school in the United States at least, was probably the most toxic structure in, in the country. So I believe that the, the free mercury and or the ionized, continuous ionizing low-dose radiation made one plasma cell in my body malignant. And I think that that's why the study showed that dentists in my age group, takes decades for that to happen, has a higher prevalence of multiple myeloma. One thing in particular uh, in the last few years uh, with my practice is to build into the uh, the safe handling and removal of, of mercury amalgams. Um, right. Yeah, the, it, it is the the gas release of the of um of mercury and other metals uh when, when these feelings are released but then the exposure to clinicians in particular and then the environmental exposure it's a big problem um yeah it's did you ever get your mercury levels tested well i have had mercury levels tested it, it's not a significant factor for me and you know our body will naturally detoxify mercury uh, it's just if it's too high of a load, that's a problem. And then the body automatically sequesters mercury in different parts of the body. The big problem in getting mercury out of the body is that most practitioners have no idea what they're doing. They're using a variety of chelation techniques that pull mercury out of where it's sequestered in the body, relatively benign, I would say. And then it sequesters it and gets it into the bloodstream. And all of a sudden, you have a toxic load of mercury that you never had before. Um, it's a very difficult process. And it takes a long time. You just don't take a couple of uh, herbal uh, capsules and you're detoxified. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And the history is very important too, isn't it? it and you know, we are seeing patients a lot. It's, it's, you know, when this load and this environmental kind of stress um, really reaches a point, the body really loses its ability to, um, to remove mercury. And then as you say, the, you know, the, the, the process to remove it safely is, is quite, um, quite in depth. Al, I wanted to, you know, the, there's, there's such a discussion here, um, you know, a, around, you know, particularly the immune system at the moment. Um, taking going back to, I'd love to go back into your um, into your you know the way you you healed um, you know your cancer. But that's that's I wanted to walk sure. people just to start thinking about the immune system in the mouth because there's so little discussion. You know, with with you know 
all of the talk now of um, you know infectious agents and so forth, how the mouth really provides this uh, interface with the immune system. And our last talk, you know, we really talked about the mouth gut connection. You know, you you're one of the best people to really kind of explain that to people, how the mouth connects to the digestive system and your specialist view of the oral microbiome. But there's another connection and that people are struggling with, with chronic inflammation, as you even described in your personal story. But then the bone loss in the jaw, and when we lose bone and this process of chronic inflammation and how it depletes the jawbone and then the support structures, the periodontal ligaments of that support our teeth, what, what should people be thinking in this? And, and how... You know, how does this connection between chronic inflammation and the immune system, um, you know, interface in the bone? So I'm going to be very controversial here because I'm not going to be as typical as you probably think I'm going to talk about. It starts in the gut. We can't, we can't close our eyes to what is happening in the gut. We just don't see it. We don't see it until it's happening in the mouth. Now, that's why the dentist has the perfect platform because a well-trained dentist can look at the mouth and see signs and symptoms of inflammation and certainly infection, but they need to understand that that inflammation and infection, 99% of the time, well, let's say 95% of the time, originated from the gut. We have to understand what is happening to the immune system in the gut. It didn't start in the mouth, although the mouth has a method to activate the immune system. It is not the primary source. The primary source actually is in the gut. 60 to 70 percent of the immune system the immune cells line the gut epithelial barrier or within the gut epithelial barrier. What is happening is the gut microbiome, which is 38 trillion cells, and we only have 30 trillion human cells. You have to understand that this is a huge mass of living material in our gut lining that communicates with the immune system. It is literally a gatekeeper. It, it senses other types of potentially pathogenic microbes, toxins that are produced by microbes, cancer cells. It can sense anything and everything. And there are so many of them, it literally communicates with these immune cells that are in the intestinal lining. And once the immune cells get triggered, it literally leaks out to every mucous membrane in the body. What actually happens is if you have a problem in the mouth, if you have a problem in the lung tissue where the bacterial um, milieu senses something wrong, it signals the gut. And the gut signals the immune system in the gut. And then that goes back to the lung or the mouth or the eyes or any other mucous membrane, which is a very interesting, not well understood concept. So the gut really is critical. And what is also going to happen is that there is a very active um, chemical and cellular response to gobble up and destroy the pathogenic or virulent um, toxin material. The, the now, power now, of the, go ahead. Of the, I was going to say the yeah the, the power of the immune system and the as you say the the marker point of the mouth as to you know and, and especially with people with you know active um, periodontal disease. I, the idea. Well, I, and I want to really talk about that because that's another very interesting subject with very recent research, periodontal disease. Do you want me to jump in yeah, on there? Yeah, because I think there's there's such a gap between, you know, the the very difficult mechanisms that you're describing in the gut and which is the root cause, but then connecting this to people that have a diagnosis in the mouth and how we heal the entire system. Absolutely. 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 So you have to understand it is not unidirectional. Um, 
it goes back and forth. And you also have to understand that it is an integrative process. It, there is not one thing that has caused the disease. And I tell you, there is not one thing that treats the disease. Um, if you want to start in the mouth, let me just tell you that dental plaque is healthy until it's not. And the problem is we don't want to destroy this dental plaque. We want to remove unhealthy dental plaque, but we don't want to destroy healthy dental plaque. And I'll tell you why. The tooth is quite unique in the body. There is no other area in the body where a hard structure pierces the skin, which would be the gum skin, and anchors itself inside sterile bone. It is like a sliding board from the tip of that tooth to the actual bone structure. And if that area was not protected in a variety of ways, bacteria, microbes, yeast, a million types of unhealthy structures, entities could literally slide down that tooth root and infect the bone and we would lose our jaws and we would die. So how does that, how does our body protect that? Our body starts off with a biofilm that is healthy and it's called dental plaque. The body has created that. I'll tell you why I know that. There was a jaw that was discovered in Morocco 300,000 years ago, pre-modern Homo sapien, and it had all 32 teeth, significantly healthy alveolar bone, no dental decay, and tartar between the root of the tooth and the alveolar process. Tartar is dental plaque that's calcified. It didn't cause gum disease or tooth decay. I don't know how old this gentleman or woman was, but at least they were probably 20, 24 years old because all 32 teeth were there. So at least 18 to 20 years old or older. Now, there was wear on the teeth, so therefore they probably were maybe 30 years old. But whatever the age is, the bone was intact, the dental plaque was, was prominent, and it was calcified, but there was no dental disease. So dental plaque is healthy, and it does and provides three important functions. And this is part of the immune system. It actually is incorporating at least two or 300 species of bacteria, as many as 700 are possible. And these bacteria are in a state of balance. There are individual bacteria that are severely virulent if they were to overgrow, like P. gingivalis. But, the, but P. gingivalis is a normal resident of healthy dental plaque. And that healthy dental plaque is producing a variety of peroxide that literally kills off any invading pathogenic, potentially pathogenic bacteria in the mouth that want to get into this sliding board where the tooth goes into the bone. The dental plaque also has chemical buffers to protect the, uh, to make the acid level a pH of 5.5 or higher so the area doesn't get too acidic, that, so it doesn't de uh, decay the tooth root. And it also um, is like a gatekeeper, allowing the minerals from the saliva to penetrate the plaque and be deposited, deposited on the root surface um, to strengthen the root 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's very important. So the, the bacteria in the gut talk to the bacteria in the mouth. And the bacteria in the gut also supports the health of the immune system that's in the gut. So when there is a dysbiosis, a breakdown in the healthy balance of bacteria in the gut and the immune system has to fight, the immune system has a battle. And if it, the immune system has to fight one battle and another battle and another battle, the immune system becomes compromised. And when the immune system is compromised and the bacteria in the gut are dysbiotic and they're talking to the bacteria in the mouth and the immune system can't support the healthy garden of bacteria in the mouth, the mouth bacteria, the dental plaque, can start to break down and change into a dysbiotic or unhealthy dental plaque.
And when we're eating the foods that 95% of our westernized societies and, and, and um, civilized societies eat, we're feeding the dental plaque, the potentially pathogenic bacteria to overgrow. And now we have a vicious cycle. We have infection in the gut that's leaking into the bloodstream. We have infection in the mouth that gets under the gum tissue and can leak into the blood system. It can leak into the lymph and it can travel the myelin sheaths of nerves that very few people understand that gets instantaneously to other parts of the body. And here's something very interesting. People that have inflammation, uh, and there's a study that shows that 94% of the U.S. population has some form of inflammation in the gum. So people that have inflammation, this inflammation called gingivitis may or may not turn into periodontitis. So periodontitis is the next stage of gum disease where the infection starts to change significantly. It's a different disease, and it goes under the gum, eats into the jawbone, and many, many serious problems can emanate from that area into the bloodstream and get into many organ systems. So there's so many articles written about periodontal disease and how it progresses and affects cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, I mean, anything, rheumatoid arthritis, anything and everything. And it's all emanating from the gut to start with, but it's changing in the mouth. Now we have two nidises of infection. We need to treat both. But here's, very, here's something interesting. No one has ever determined why some people get gingivitis and it never progresses to periodontitis, or some people get gingivitis and it progresses to periodontitis. So there was a study that was done in 2016. In my mind, it is mind boggling. What the study, do you want me to tell you about the study? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what the study showed, or what they did, the, the researchers took normal human gingival fibroblasts. These are the gum tissue cells. And they cultured them and they added LPS. So lipopolysaccharides, LPS, are the cell membranes of gram-negative bacteria. What that means is these are dead parts of the cell and they use the cell from a very virulent bacteria that a bacterium that causes periodontitis and it's called P. gingivalis, porphyromonas gingivalis. So they took this dead porphyromonas gingivalis and they added it to the gingival, human gingival fibroblasts. The gingival fibroblasts are alive. Now the gingival fibroblasts actually create inflammation. But when the LPS is at high levels, the mitochondria, these are the batteries of the cell that make it work. So batteries like the batteries in a flashlight that allow the light to burn um, are the battery, the, uh, are the mitochondria in the cells. And that's what creates the energy for any and every cell in your body, except red blood cells. Any and every cell in your body only functions because of the mitochondria. Some cells have a couple hundred, some cells like the muscle cells uh, or heart muscle cells have several thousand mitochondria per cell. So it's pretty impre impressive. So these mitochondria are critically involved with the function of the cell. The LPS causes the mitochondria to create free radicals. Free radicals, you've ever, you, everybody's heard about free radicals. And these are very damaging to the cell. When that happens and it produces a lot of free radicals, again, it's the result of the LPS, then cytokines, these are chemical um, messengers from the immune system leak out and affect the immune system, affect the osteoclastic activity, and it stimulates bone damage. Now, here's what's interesting. When the researchers looked at these mitochondria that were producing these free radicals, and they um, reduced the production of the free radicals, the cytokines were not reacting and the bone damage didn't occur. So what they did was 
they then stimulated the mitochondria, the cells, with more LPS, but they stopped the mitochondria production of the free radicals, and the disease never turned from gingivitis to periodontitis. So here's the, here's the takeaway. If you can, in one way or another, stop the mitochondria pr pr from producing more free radicals because they're stimulated by this bacteria, you may prevent gum inflammation from becoming periodontitis. So another study in 2018 showed that vitamin K2 will actually prevent the excess production of free radicals by the mitochondria. That's great news because vitamin K2 is a supplement that we can take and it might be a fantastic adjunct to gum treatment to help prevent the progression of active periodontitis. Now I'm connecting the dots. This, that study hasn't been done yet. Maybe I'll try to figure out how to do it, but I think that that's an interesting subject. And I think that's the critical element of why bone is being breaking, bro broken down. And that is the P. gingivalis's very virulent cell wall is stimulating the mitochondria of the gingival fibroblast to produce too much free um, radicals to stimulate the then the production of uh, the bones, the cells that are going to break down the bone. It's absolutely, it's absolutely fascinating, fascinating how we're how learning about the mechanisms of you know the the progression, as you say, bleeding gums to to bone loss, which are two different processes. How in that first study, the 2016 study, did they turn off the free, free radical production? Do you, they used the a, they used, I can't remember the, um, the, the chemical that they used, but the chemical that they used was a type of an antioxidant, meaning that it gobbled up these free radicals so that the, the uh, mitochondria were not overproducing and destroying themselves. So they managed the production of, of the inflammation. It, it's fascinating because- That's right. you know, yeah, that's, that, right. that, that's, a, that's a direct message is that, you know, we can control these, you know, outputs from our body, you know, via, you know, the, uh, the inputs we put in. Um, and the, the subsequent study you mentioned is K2 is potentially one of these, you know, big factors that can stop the overproduction of inflammation in the body. Al, it's, it's fascinating yeah. how, how the, the research is playing out. Um, I, I just wanted to, th there's a few questions here that I thought we'd, we'd jump to. Um, okay. I think we, so I'm just going to throw a couple up on the screen. So now that, now that we see for people that have suffered these, um, some of these issues, um, yeah, obviously solutions are a problem and, you know, I, I want to dive into your protocol particularly after this, but I thought we'd just, you know, cover some questions because it is a difficult situation when people have kind of been midstream um, with their with their disease process, and you know they're wondering about solutions as to what to do. So, is there any way to grow back gums after suffering from gum recession? Okay, we just have a little bit. Yep. Have you got me there or? Okay. I see a question on the screen. Okay. I'll see. Is it my, it might be my, have you got me there now? I've got a little delay in the, in the stream now. Oh, oh we've, we've just lost Al there for a second. So I'll just wait. For him to pop back so we'll take some questions and we'll jump in on um back into al's um protocol in just a second he might have just had a little there we go we're back i see you there you okay. go all right great yep so so there's just a couple of questions here that that i thought we'd jump into so thu chong says is there any way to grow back gums after suffering from gum recession the Simple answer is no. So there are um, surgical procedures 
that can be done. Some are very invasive, others are very patient friendly that can allow the gum tissue um, to be grafted on top of the root, but the bone, once it's broken down, is gone forever for the most part. And the gum literally needs the scaffolding of the bone to support. Gum grafting can work for some cosmetic reasons uh, sometimes, but once the gum is receded, that means that the bone that used to be most likely from periodontal disease, but there are other reasons why the bone has been broken down. Or maybe a person even was born with very, very little or no bone there because it, is ten, it tends to be tissue paper thin in its healthy state. So it's possible that the bone wasn't even there and the gums eventually weakened and it receded and it will not grow back by itself, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's always a sad, but you know, it, it, as you say, there's, there's, there's ways to consolidate, um, you know, the, what we have left and that, and obviously the, the goal is certainly to maintain. So I'm going to, I will, I will mention though, that if the gum has receded and there was inflammation and the inflammation is brought under control, the gum will actually creep back, grow back a little bit, but it's not going to grow back the way it was. Sure. Mm -hmm. Al, in terms of, because um, you, you've looked at this a little bit, where do you think that the, the dosage recommendation should be for vitamin K2? By uh, vitamin K2, ending 320 micro the maximum for need to take shows that many, many more that is not uh, I take sorry I just had a little connection issue there have you got us there I see you yeah do you want to just repeat it just the the stream pause a little bit there would you like to just repeat your 320 micrograms a day is what i take there is some research that suggests that's an ideal uh, amount to support normal healthy mitochondria as well as you know vitamin k2 has a tremendous amount to do with um, calcium metabolism and putting calcium in bones and not putting it in soft tissue. So th this is a good uh, uh, supplement to take. But you know you can get vitamin K2 in natural foods, so you need to think about what you're eating. Absolutely. But you and, can't take and, too much. There's, a, there's not an overdose of vitamin K2. Yeah, and so critical too, and in conjunction with, uh, works in conjunction with vitamin D3. Okay, so there's yes. one more question here that I thought, and we've covered this before, but I thought we'd just touch on this just because it's it's important. Um, Paul at Smith asked, what are your thoughts on oral probiotics? So I'm going to be controversial also in this answer. Um, let's see. Oral probiotics will provide a transient benefit, but not a permanent benefit, and it's a waste of money. What you want to do is, and I told you that there, this is an integrated treatment. You just can't take probiotics and be healthy. You can't take probiotics and have a healthy gut. It just doesn't work. You have to do several and then unconventional cancer protocol. Okay. Things like Okay, I think we're just having a little problem with the connection there. But for those still, yes. Have you got me there, Al? I only hear. For those watching the stream, can you just confirm? Yeah, I think, Al, you're just having a, an issue with, do you want to just connect and reconnect again? And then we'll just, um, we'll just re resume that question there. 
Okay, I'll just give Al a second there to to reconnect because he seems to be having uh, some connection yeah. issue. I see myself. Okay, I think we're back. Can you hear me there, Al? Are we there? Yeah, yeah. sorry, it's just um, the connection. is just as good as you were to start. <laughs> okay, so I think um, I think the stream cut out a little bit there on, as you were talking about probiotics. So oral probiotics are transient. So they may create a slight benefit, but this is not the answer. What the answer is, is you need to incorporate several things. And that's the way I created my unconventional cancer protocols. And what I was saying was my unconventional cancer protocols have nothing to do with cancer per se. I do not have a cure for cancer. I'll say that right up front. But I do have a method to support my immune system, which is something anybody and everybody should be doing for themselves. So the most important microbiome that needs to be supported, once the gut microbiome is supported, it becomes nutrient-dense and anti-inflammatory then you can actually enhance the immune system and the mouth bacteria follows suit. Now, you have to have good oral hygiene. You have to have other factors in place, um, not over-exercising, good sleep habits, um, dealing with emotional stress. All of these factors affect the gut microbiome, which absolutely affects the oral microbiome. But if you only brush your teeth and floss your teeth correctly, but you don't do anything else right, you're still going to have gum disease. If you take an oral uh, probiotic, maybe it'll cover it and take care of something, inflammation, as it sits there, but it doesn't solve any other problem. And if you only took probiotics uh, swallowing it for your gut, it's not going to do a whole lot if you have a terrible uh, diet and or you're emotionally whacked out. So there, there are lots of factors that have to be in place. But um, oral probiotics, in my opinion, are transient and a waste of money. So the, the movement of the scientific literature and understanding of these chronic diseases is all shifting towards this multifactorial approach. And the... Periodontal disease in particular is such a complex uh, condition, you know, as you describe, you know, the, the way that we go about it really is a whole body approach and it's such a valuable um, insight into what is happening in the body. Um, but, you know, the way you're describing, you know, we can learn all the different mechanisms and the, the, the powerful connection to the gut, but the, the overall story is so multifaceted and we have to come at it that way. How, do, how is your, you know, I'd love to, let's dive into your, into your protocol and how you healed your own, you know, your, your own bone metabolism and, and how you think that that can be linked because this connection between practitioner self-healing and, um, you know, building these, these multifactorial approaches for patients, I think is just so powerful. So let me tell you where I was and where I am today. So in August of 2019, a year after I was diagnosed, I was in my teeth, to know, and I understand that my bones are fragile. Um, I had been quite um, not not getting worse, not getting any better, um, which was impressive because I was supposed to die. Uh, so I. And I twist to my left nine degrees, throw the dental floss away. When that happens, my right femur snaps in half. I fall to the floor. I break two ribs. And I snap my right humerus in half. I'm lying and writhing on the floor with pain, screaming. I uh, can't move. My wife. environment now. Try to to uh, get out of the house and into the hospital, and they fix my right femur because I would have bled to death because the right femoral artery would have been uh, severed. It's humorous, and I am ready to die. 
I reject everything. They put me in a hospice hospital to die. If things going on in the next week or two, in a hospital bed, turns out that my wife phenomenal and gives me a little bit tough love and she said you know you've never been a victim you're a survivor your cancer protocols were working for you until this little accident get back on your cancer protocols we'll get a physical therapist in and let's see if we can rouse you uh, I'm in catheterized I am on a bedpan I am highly um, drugged with narcotics it's pretty bad but I'm ready to die but I rallied and within a month, I was able to start walking with a walker, and I'm on my cancer protocols until May of 2020, where I have a new PET scan, and the PET scan shows I am cancer-free. Um, that's not remission or cure, because PET scans don't tell everything. But anyhow, I'm doing amazingly well. So these cancer protocols, what I have done to uh, do amounts to research to support my immune system. And here are the, um, the avenues that I have taken. Needed to research a way of eating, not only provide nutrients to my body that it required, but also avoided anti-nutrients, toxic substances, and other foods that I probably was eating on a regular basis. So I created and did research on this diet, and my diet now is basically an animal-based diet called a carnivore diet. I do add some plants, a little bit that are low in anti-nutrients, which are the phytates, lectins, and oxalates, because they're very damaging to the gut. And I've even created a little book called The Better Belly Blueprint, which is the way I eat. So this is what I have done. And the science will blow you away. And I will that a medical clinic that has been treating patients since 2011, they've treated over 5,000 patients. They only treat severe chronic diseases and cancer. They use their strict animal-based diet, no supplements, no medicine. And they have a variety of reports that are very compelling. This is really part to this way of eating. So this is very anti-inflammatory, supports every nutrient my body needs to stay healthy, and therefore it can support my immune system. Get involved with maintaining a very healthy gut. You can take and you, you certainly can just gazillion probiotics. Most of the probiotics that are on the market are and um, bifidobacteria species based. These are great. They actually will create metabolites, which are biologically active chemicals that pass the stomach acid, get into the gut, and do a lot of benefit. The only problem is these bacteria that go into the mouth, get into the stomach, are destroyed by the stomach acid. That's one of our main primary lines of defense. We have a stomach acid of 1 to 1.3. It kills almost all microbes. That's why we eat and drink and we don't get sick the next day because these microbes that are in foods and whatever else we're putting in our mouth will actually get killed in the stomach acid. But the metabolites go through. So those are good, but they're only 50% effective. The only um, probiotics that will resist are resistant to the stomach acid are, are called spore-based probiotics. They're natural. They're existing in, in dirt, earth, organic, dark, wonderful black earth. And uh, that's where that's what our primal ancestors ate because it was on our food and it resisted the stomach acid. These are not growing in the dirt. They are encapsulated in spores. But the stomach acid and the environment of the, of the gut stimulates these spores to germinate. So the, the spores actually produce all kinds of metabolites that are beneficial for the gut bacteria, but they also reproduce themselves. 
when they reproduce themselves, they stimulate your unique bacteria in the gut to grow in quantity and quality and diversity. Your microbiome, your signature microbiome in the gut is as unique to you as your fingerprint. And there's never one person's microbiome the same as another. And that's why it's very difficult, if not impossible, to say, you need this strain of bacteria to be healthy. That's not true. Now, that strain may be good. It may not be good. It may have a metabolite that works for you. It may not. But your natural gut bacteria needs to flourish. And spore-based probiotics assist in that growth of diversity of bacteria. But you have to have the right diet and other factors in place. What you're doing today, right now, with the, the computer screen, is creating dirty electromagnetic fields. These are damaging to our cells and our gut. Um, a variety of stress and over-exercise and poor sleep habits and, and um, factors like that actually affect our gut. We need to be in control of a lot of different things. But if we can we can support our immune system. So diet is critical. I also do some pulse electromagnetic field therapy. Now this is an interest. There is a huge number of medical pulse electromagnetic which stimulates nodes of cell frequencies that uh, it's amazing. These frequencies cell membrane on transport in the cell and supports the production of a. So I use that mitochondria and and all chronic diseases are diseases of dysfunctional my. Like I put on Titus is a result of the gingival fibroblasts mitochondria becoming dysfunctional. So if we can improve the mitochondria of cells, if we can improve the gut bacteria, if we can improve our diet, these three elements, these three huge elements will improve our immune system. And there are some interesting ways to test the health of our immune system. One is to test your um, uh, blood test for 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Vitamin D is a critical element for immune support. It should be between 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. But uh, in a case like mine, I'm dealing with cancer, I want a little higher vitamin D. But uh, vitamin D is, is a very good biomarker of the health of the immune system. There's another biomarker that is not well known, and I've been writing about it. done it as glycemic, the fluctuation glucose every four hour day, seven days a week. You can't do a finger stick because you can only stick so many times before it's a pin cushion. Sorry, Al, uh, your your connection Sorry, just Al, broke I, up. Do you want to repeat that, that, that second tip? That, that second tip. What are we, I didn't know where we lost it. The, the, the second the test, ability, the biomarker that you're taking. Yes, so the glycemic is um in your glucose is so many metabolic that lead to all kinds of chronic diseases and if you can tell Al, your connection is just breaking up a bit um we're just coming to the end do you, do you want to just try and reconnect again just so we can finish to round this off sure how do we, um, how do i do that uh if you just, to, just um enter and re-exit just so we can finish um because it's just, I think there's some interesting questions here and, and to round into your book. We'll just be a second as Al reconnects. We just had some connection issues. Um, so the, the the things 
he was talking about is his better belly blueprint, which we'll talk about now, which he used to heal his own metabolic bone cancer. Um, but also, too, what we're discussing is, you know, his um, protocols. You know, if you have periodontal disease, then Here these I am. are the. All right, we're back. Yeah, sorry, it was just breaking up a little bit. Um, but sorry. yeah, so the, the second test you were talking about. Um, it's yeah, called glycemic variability. Glycemic variability is a fluctuation of the glucose metabolism throughout the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can do it for a period of two weeks, and you use what's called a continuous glucose monitor, CGM, attaches to your arm, for example. That's how I did it. It's a little fiber that goes into the tissue of your uh, skin, and it actually registers the interstitial glucose every five to ten minutes until the 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 unit stops working. It takes two weeks, and it stops working. And all that data is recorded. It goes back to the company. It goes on your uh, app on the phone, and you determine a standard deviation of this fluctuation in glucose continuously. And that standard deviation has been shown and published in the last year or two to significantly identify how risky you are and can and how strong or robust you are. So if the standard deviation is 20, it tends to be indicating a weaker immune uh, susceptibility to other chronic diseases between 20 and relatively ideal. 14, it indicates a very robust immune system. And you can tweak your diet and your gut microbiome to help improve your glucose uh, variability. And interestingly, here I am doing what I'm doing. My standardization is 10. And when I got that report and the company called me and told me, whoa, because I'm supposedly theoretically have a extremely um, weak immune system. This That's a test people can that tells uh, this um, glucose monitor for a period. They, they sell it to anybody and everybody. Generally, you have to have diabetes for your physician to a prescription for it to get it from other companies. This company does sell it to anybody and everybody. I'm not sure exactly how much it costs. I think it's around $180 or so. And they do all the data collection and um, give you the report, which is kind of interesting. It's a good biomarker, certainly you're trying to understand how healthy your immune system is. It, it's it's a great piece of information for people to looking to get a bit closer, you know, to you know what's exactly happening to the body and also the inputs. Al, do you see, you know, to round this off, you know, for people that you know are detecting and have been diagnosed with gum issues and uh, chronic inflammation and bone problems, your approach is coming at mu a multifaceted um, way now with your, your, your better belly protocol, um, your biomarkers. Do you see this as something that we, we can integrate into uh, you know, functional dental um, process, uh, you know, practice? Absolutely. Where we Absolutely. Can, like th this Absolutely. to me is, you know, the, these are the things we talk about with patients, but you know, this is all there. And as you said, the literature supports this now. And so anyone with periodontal disease and gum issues, you know, if they can start to get their head around these things and start to knock, you know, some of the things off that, you know, you did all this research yourself as well. You know, th these are powerful things that, that people can help their own health. Uh, can you, if there's you, just a few questions you, about your book and your protocol. Do you want to just sure. round off there and just tell us all about it? Well, blueprint, you can get it. Uh, a mini ebook that I've downloaded by a Kindle app called Is Your Gut You? It's about the gut being relationship other areas of the body. And again, 
and uh, anybody a healthy diet, improve their gut microbiome, understand how to clean the mouth. We we'll talk about the book too, and and if they're doing these things amazingly, you won't have gum disease. And there are studies that show, three human studies in the last five plus years, that show if you only change the diet, remove the junk and processed foods, the bacteria in the mouth will overgrow, but in a healthy, balanced way. The inflammation will decrease, periodontal disease will decrease, and once that happens, it is a sign of a healthier gut and healthier, potentially future um, re uh, remission and or prevention of chronic diseases. It's, I think Al this is I think this is mind-boggling and um, simple to do if you just connect the dots and you're proactive. You got to do it. I'm mean, about it. It doesn't matter. I mean, you put it so well. I mean, this information is so difficult for people to access and understand. But you know, your your life of you know clinical special speciality, um, understanding you know people's gums, people's immune system, and then going through the um, you know the the your own health journey to uh, to to heal these these processes within your body which are certainly connected I, I just think that you know i completely agree that this is an amazing powerful tool for people to to start to learn and you know it, it's it's day by day isn't it? it it you you learn something new every day and you it's it's not overnight and you know i just think there's so much hope out there al the, the name of your book is the bella Be, better belly blueprint and there was a second ebook better. yeah better and killing you. It's just breaking up there a little bit. So, uh, uh, I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll post the second the, one is, um, is, is what well, I'll I will get the um yeah, the link. Too bad that it's breaking. Up. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's like. <laughs> It's okay. We'll we'll get that those links through. Like I said, we're they, can, they can find you at dranberg dot com. Correct. All right, Al. I'll, I'm going to do a a post take on this so they can get all your links. But look, this has been so, it's it's amazing to hear how all this is coming together, isn't it? You know, we've been talking about this for years yeah. now. But the web the website. It, the website, the website is drdannenberg.com without a dot, just D-R-D-A-N-E-N-B-E-R-G.com. Um, but if they, if you just Google my name, you'll, you'll, lots of stuff will pop up. So it's drdannenberg.com and they can book personal consults with you too? Absolutely. The website has a way to do that. I do consults all over the world as a matter of fact. Yeah, and I, I can't recommend that high enough because you know, for the level of you're getting specialist level detail and the amount of care and you know, you're just a great guy to talk to. I, I always enjoy your chats and and you know, thank you so much for sharing your your personal story. We're so happy to hear you well and you know you're you're such a gift to this world and you've got so much more to give and we'll have to continue this conversation soon. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Danberg. We had some connection issues today, but as always, it was wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you have any more questions, please leave them in the comments, and we will aim to get those uh, links so you can follow up and find.